end, I'd like to introduce Lynn Holt, who will introduce our presenter and session for today. Thank you, everybody, who is uh, all the people who are on Zoom and in Okamak. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Angela McCarthy, uh, who is a new face to IOR, and she is a lecturer, junior fellow, and um, junior fellows director, I should say, and coordinator in experiential learning in the political science department at the University of Florida. Her research focuses on public opinion and political behavior. She is primarily interested in the effects of religiosity on social and economic concerns. Her research addresses the influence of religiosity on redistributive policies, economic inequality, social justice concerns, and values-based uh, or moral issues. Dr. McCarthy teaches public opinion, religion and politics, policy, ethics and leadership, and research methods. And she's also affiliated with the Bob Graham Center for Public Service at the University of Florida. So please welcome Dr. McCarthy, and I'll let her go on. <laughs> Hello, I am going to share my screen. Um, so I hopefully everyone can see everything. Is it is it sharing? Are we good? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So I have a lot to cover 400 and so years of history, religious history uh, in the United States in a very short period of time. So I am going to be moving through the material uh, as quickly as I possibly can with still being coherent. So uh, if you have any questions, we can ask those at the end, um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer those for you. So what I want to do today is start with why religion matters in the United States and in our political history. So we'll talk about it and current public opinion trends. So we'll start off with a history and then give some indication of why this matters. So some explanations of where we've been and where we're going, and then give you a different way to think about religion. So political scientists and scholar religion and politics scholars are thinking about religion differently than we have thought about religion in the past. And so I'm going to give you a snapshot of that, and then we'll move into a field, a new and emerging field called called morality policy or morality politics. And then we'll look forward to what will happen or maybe something we think will happen in the 2024 election or 2022, 2024 election. Okay, so that's my, my idea and agenda for today. So before we start, start with the history of religion, we need to talk about what is religion or what constitutes as religion. And so religion, traditionally was thought of as this social group phenomenon. Um, so this is religious belonging. So what denomination are you? So religion as a, as a social group phenomenon where individuals can actually practice their uh, religious beliefs, and that is surrounded by or encompasses a common set of these beliefs, so religious believing. And through this definition of religion, people are accepting and recognizing that there is some type of higher power. And through this social group, religious practice, and religious set of beliefs, we are attempting to explain the world around us. And so give justification to why some things happen and how some things happen. So this is the definition of religion that we will be using as we move through this and um, through this through the history of religion in the United States. So a large portion of what I'm lecturing on today comes from this this book. You can actually get a couple. There are a couple of copies at the library right now for for checkout. So um, these are the leading scholars in the field of religion and politics, and they have this. When I teach religion and politics, I use this textbook in my my lectures, and and students really like this. and And I think this is a really good introduction to what religion is. And so, just to give credit where credit is due, some of the things that I have here is is from this textbook, and and also uh, my own research and my my own data analysis and and some other data analysis. And I'll point those out to you as we go along. But if you're interested in a snapshot of religion and politics, this is a really good um, resource. So. 
Okay, so let's start with the history of religion in the United States or the legacy really that religion has left us and, and why are we where we are today? Um, so we will start with the Puritans. Like I've promised, we're gonna do 400 or so years of history. So we'll start with the Puritans briefly and we'll move through where we are, um, which is this growth in individuals being spiritual, but not necessarily religious, or you may have heard of it called the rise of the nuns or the rise of the unaffiliated, which we'll get to in a second. So Puritans in the 1600s came to the United States in, well, it wasn't the United States at the time, but came to this new land in hope to fulfill this covenant of the new Israel. They, they really viewed this land as, as the promised land that, that they were one biblically promised, but, but also a land that showed and gave them great potential. And they felt this moral urgency in their mission to live great and pious lives at lives and this this legacy gave us the legacy of religious pluralism that we have in the United States today today or like this this um being passionate about religious religion or religious zeal. And one of the things that the Puritans set up and put into motion was a strong sense of civic identity and civic institutions. And they, they had this objective of coming to this new land, this promised land, this new Israel, um, if you will, to shape society for the better. So they were running away from the Church of England in, in hopes of forming a better land. And some of the things that were going on um, in their ideology was that they, they believed in this covenant theology where the community is the focus of their, their life, and it's what drives the things that they think about and how they make decisions. So, so their, their um, organization was very community centric. And through this community centric organization, they formed a model of government. And they didn't believe that there was this divine right of kings. Um, and, and it was the king's authority to tell society how society would live, but rather it was the community of people and individuals that told society how they should live. And to do so, to, to fulfill this community's covenant with God, um, they, they were really um, loose with, with making laws or strict, I should say, and making laws and precautions and putting precautions in place to prevent people from becoming a slave to sin. Okay. And, and so they, their communities were, were, really focused on making sure that individuals didn't commit bad crimes or didn't do bad things. And to do this, they had morally strict and, and intrusive laws. And as a result of this, of this we still see some of this um, littered throughout. And when we get to what's going on in current day, especially with the evangelical Protestants, um, we, we see a flavor of Puritanism coming up in, in the decisions that we're making and how we are organizing ourselves politically. So the Puritans, while a long time ago, they their um, theology and ideology and their skeptical view of human nature is still predominant in our society. So if we move forward in history a little bit, so 1700s to the 1800s, um, this is when our country was first forming and our forefathers were thinking about the constitution and the, the amendments to the constitution. And in our first amendment, the religion clause, it says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So what this means is that at the time, people did not want our government to favor or limit one religion over another. Predominantly, they didn't want favor or limiting of religion uh, because they were worried that if, if government allowed for one religion to be limited or one religion to be favored over another, that that religion could 
potentially be their own religion. So in order to make sure that everyone got to practice, i.e. themselves, got to practice their own religion, they needed to make it so that everyone could practice. And so all religious believers wanted freedom of religion. Um, and the best way to get freedom of religion was to grant it to everyone. And because of this, we are left with this world of pluralism or a lot of different religious groups in the United States. And I'll show you what that breakdown looks like in a second. But before I do that, um, something happened in the 1800s, and that was that churches were actually cut off from government funds. So the public school system used to operate um, where the Protestant Bible was taught in schools. And Catholics, as well as other religious organizations or, or denominations, had a problem with the Protestant Bible being taught in, in the public schools. And so they started forming their own schools. And long story short, this disestablishment or lack of government government funds led to religious groups needing independent or um, individuals in their congregations to support the congregations. Well, because of this, uh, because of this disestablishment or the cut off from government funds and the need for members of the congregation to pay for those congregations, churches started competing with one another. And so this is Economics 101, if you will, churches are, are literally, literally and figuratively competing for congregants to join their faith. Okay. And this is just a, a snapshot um, from the uh, census of American religion in 2020, thanks to the people at the Public Religion Research Institute. You can see all the different types of religious organizations in the United States that because of churches competing and religious denominations competing with one another and this free exercise of religion allowed for religious groups to pop up and different denominations or sects really in, in um, among religious denominations to, to pop up and compete for their share of the electorate. And so we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this 23, so this this um, pink piece of this pie is actually people who are unaffiliated with the religion. And you'll notice that it's, it's the largest number. Now, that doesn't mean that we are um, all non-religious. That's not true. But keep this in mind. Keep the 23% here um, in mind because it's going to help us understand the political landscape today. So all this to say is that these are all the different types of religious organizations or religious groups in the United States or, or how people are identifying. And that's really due to that, that pluralism. Okay. So then we get to, in, in our history, something called the evangelical dimension. And you might be thinking of evangelical Protestants and Yes, um, evangelical Protestants fall within this evangelical dimension, but what I'm talking about here um, is really those individuals who believe that the Bible is the literal word of God, and it is written by God, and it's the authority of God's revelation to us, and these evangelical, um, in this evangelical dimension, they are stressing this born again experience, which, which means you at some point in life need to accept Jesus Christ as your savior. And one of the things we'll see is that the evangelical dimension or which will become evangelical Protestants uh, are really successful because part of this dimension is that they need to recruit members to make a place in this marketplace where religious organizations are competing for the attention of people in the electorate um, and, and, the, and the public. So in this even evangelical dimension, um, this is a branch of Protestantism, which by the way, the Puritans um, were Protestant, right? So it's a branch of Protestantism where um, that that has divided from um, the, the Puritan religion and is more committed to the Bible as being the word of God and but differentiates or is different from the Puritans in that it stresses this born again experience and it recruits it, it um, thrives and functions off of recruiting members. 
So these authors, um, I, I just thought that this was interesting. So, so I'm including it. I've, I've read, they have a book and then they also have um, a couple of journal articles. And this is the, the title of the book is called The Churching of America. And what they found is that one of the reasons evangelical, this evangelical dimension has survived in recent years and actually has flourished is because other religious denominations and other religious groups may have religious messages that are watered down. And when the religious messages are watered down, people don't know what to do. They, they go to church to find this authoritative message about what religion is and what we should do about life. And so when certain religious denominations are wishy-washy, and we'll get to that in a second, but when certain religious organizations are, are wishy-washy on certain stances, um, especially political stances, then or political or doctrinal stances, so what, what the church believes, then people don't have really a, a good sense of why they are belonging in that religion. And this goes back to that pluralism message um, where people will just then leave and they will go to a different religious denomination or they'll form their own religious, religious group if they can't find the authoritative message that they're looking for. So in this religious marketplace, it's really a competition of souls or a competition for souls. And the more intense competition, the more likely individuals are wanting to go to that religious group. So the higher demand there is. And I, um, when I was in my undergraduate, um, at my undergraduate school, there was this row, it was called Church Row, and it was all the churches that were on campus. It was three or four blocks long, and there's probably 15 churches all on the same street. And every Wednesday, they would open up their doors and have, they would give all the students um, lunch. And I used to joke all the time that they were getting members based on who had the best brownies. And that, that's not really what was going on, but in a way it was. They were opening up and competing in this marketplace for students to join their, their congregation. And um, we, see, we see this happening a lot with um, millennials and, and Gen Zers, okay? So this this religious marketplace is something that people are thinking about. And if they don't really like the church that they're in, there are no consequences to leaving that church and joining something, joining another church. All of this has led to some individuals identifying as spiritual and religious or spiritual, but not religious, <laughs> religious, but not spiritual. You get, you get the gist. So this spiritual group has come out of and is born out of um, a rejection in many ways to traditional religiosity or this doctrinal belief. And it's born from a skepticism uh, in religion or of religion. And really it's focused, uh, these people who are identifying as spiritual and not religious and just as a disclaimer, I'm speaking in general gen, generalizations here, and I'm not um, saying that this is true for every single person, but generally what we see is that people who are identifying as spiritual but not religious are focused on the self and not and, and the self experience being here and in, and in life and not the collective or community. And so this is just a snapshot of what I mean with people are increasingly identifying as spiritual but not religious. So this first little um, graph or first part of the graph here for religious and spiritual, this number is actually declining. So people in the United States who believe that religion or who say that religion, uh, they are both religious and spiritual, uh, in 2012, that was at almost 60%, so 59%. And then by 2017, that number dropped to 48%. And if we carry this graph on to 2021, it goes down a little bit. Okay. Um, and so this is the this second part or this middle part is what we really want to pay attention to. This is the spiritual but not religious individuals. So these people believe in some type of higher power, but they're not necessarily identifying with a religious group, religious denomination, religious organization. So they may just be 
spiritual in that they believe in the existence of something. They don't know what that something is, or they might not know what that something is, um, but they believe in something that's greater than themselves, but not necessarily religious organizations. And that number has grown in recent years. And if you carry, again, if you carry this on a little bit more, you'll see um, the 27% is, is a little higher. Okay. So this led this, this, from in 2017 and, and before, this led to secularization and secularization theory. And the idea here is that as societies become more advanced and they are becoming more educated, the importance of religion is declining. So people care less about religion when they know more and they are using things like the scientific method and rational approaches. And the reason for this is that people can justify why certain things are happening in their life without needing religion or without placing an emphasis on religion. So all of this to say we are we're in a crisis. We're having a culture shift in in the United States in 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 terms of what to do with religious people or where they are, where they fall in politics. So we're we're undergoing this culture shift culture shift. Um, and this is that um, individuals are identifying with being secular or having personal secularism, which I, I, I will talk about at the end, if, if I can keep this short enough, I'll talk about secularism at the end. Um, but people are moving from this spirituality and having religion to dropping that religion part. So they're moving to being if not, if they're, if anything, they're spiritual, but more likely if they are moving out of religion, they are moving to be, to being what's called the nuns. Um, and the first time I taught this class, I said there was the rise of the nuns, but I didn't write it out. And all of my students thought that I was talking about the rise of the Catholic nuns and like the nuns were revolting. Um, that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about in the rise of the nuns are the people who are not affiliated with a particular religious denomination, okay? And so this is a lot on this slide. I know that there's a lot here, but what I want you to pay attention to is this purple line. Um, this is the rise of the nuns or the unaffiliated. So what we see from 2006 to 2020 is that this line is on this upward trajectory, okay? So unaffiliated is rising, but Something interesting happened in 2018 and 2019. The rise started to slow, um, still, still creeping, um, but the unaffiliated is growing in number. Meanwhile, if you look at the blue lines, the blue lines are decreasing in number. So in 2016, uh, 2006, there were a lot more um, um, white evangelical Protestants than there are now, or a larger share of the population. So the rise of the nuns means unaffiliated or growing in, in number, um, thanks to millennials and, and younger. So you may have heard of political polarization or this culture wars theory or culture wars thesis. Um, the culture wars is a result of um, this culture shift that we're having. And the fundamental thing with culture wars is that one opinion cannot exist without the other, uh, with, with the existence of another opinion. So there's a clash over the fundamental components and values and lifestyle and sets of belief, fundamental clash with how one person sees something and how someone else sees something. And the threat, the differences in opinion is actually a threat to someone else's way of life. And I'll, I'll give you an example of this later on, but, but um, just as a sneak peek, think about abortion policy here. Um, when you're thinking about whether abortion or, or um, those that you know who make a strong argument either in favor for um, the legality of abortion or those who are, are, who are against um, abortion, one cannot exist without, an, with, without, without the other viewpoint dying, okay? And so this culture wars has led us to this clash over fundamental viewpoints in life. And what it's led to is these two camps, conservatives and progressives. What we'll notice is that conservatives 
i.e. the Republican Party and progressives, i.e. the Democratic Party. And it's left us in this world where conservatives are emphasizing traditional values, where progressives are stressing the importance of diversity. Okay, and this this divide um, in beliefs can cr- cut across political and, and and religious lines, and we'll see this in a second. Uh, what used to be uh, the the typical way of thinking about the influence of religion in politics was to think, well, how are Catholics voting? How are Protestants voting? How are Jews voting? Well, that's not what's happening anymore. What's happening is that traditional or conservative Catholics are now aligning with traditional or conservative evangelicals and progressive Catholics are aligning with Jews, progressive Jews and the religiously unaffiliated. So this culture wars um, and the struggle over traditional values and encouraging diversity among moral beliefs has has really wreaked havoc on on how um, we're thinking about voting behaviors and voting trends, especially among the religious. So just to recap where we started, you know, 400 years ago, uh, the Puritans left this legacy of self-government and they wanted a sense of um, moral, a moral national governing body. And they gave a bunch of laws or, or set out on this pilgrimage to give the, the what would be the country um, a set of moral laws to act as the compass for society. And this growth of po- pluralism came from um, the founding fathers setting up our constitution so that everyone could practice the religion that they saw fit. Um, and because anyone could practice anything in terms of religion, uh, the, this diversity led to competition, which yielded this evangelical zeal or the, the plight to recruit to one's own religion. And that plight to recruit has transitioned in a lot of ways to a moral political campaign. And so now political parties are competing and pulling for their share of the electorate, um, especially among religious individuals. And what's going on, uh, so that's the political party spectrum. So what's going on on the side, the other side of that is that people of faith or religious individuals, they're doubling down. They're seeing these, this shift or this culture war as a battleground over some very core and fundamental components of the, their being and, and what their, their religious tenets and principles um, tell them. And so it is their moral obligation to become politically active and to respond when they see injustice in society. And remember with culture wars, um, for one idea or value to survive, the other must die. They cannot act in the same space. And so uh, not only does the public pick up on this, um, but they are, are also encouraging politicians to behave in a way that picks a side. And we see this in our politicians today. They are responding to this call um, of of people wanting them to pick a side. Where do they stand on same-sex marriage? Where do they stand on the death penalty? Where do they stand on immigration? Those those issues. So I will talk about these different religious traditions um, very briefly, just to give uh, an understanding of where we are now. So we talked about the history and some of the things that we need to think about when we consider religious traditions. And so now I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what's the electorate like in terms of religion now, and what do we think they will be like in in two years from now or four years from now, so so where we're going. And these percentages that I have here is just a snapshot again of the percentage of the population that identifies with each one of these traditions, okay? So the first is evangelical Protestants. Evangelical Protestants, again, they are emphasizing this born again experience accepting Jesus Christ as your savior, your personal savior. And without this born again, accepting of Jesus Christ as one's personal savior, you cannot become an, or you are not an evangelical Protestant. They also prioritize scripture um, as the Bible is the literal word of God. So there's no degree of interpretation here. The Bible was sent to us from God 
in in the way that it is exactly how it is and there's no human error in, included in that bible and they believe in generally conservative tenets of christian faith so evangelical protestants are both conservative in their doctrinal ideology or the principles of their faith but also we'll see that they're conservative in in um, politics as well and and how they are voting politically so how did evangelical Protestants become what it was in 2016 and then what it was in 2020? Well, there's a lot that was going on in the 1950s, which led to a lot going on in the 1960s. And in a lot of ways, in the 1970s with Jimmy Carter and then in the 80s with Ronald Reagan, um, it was a backlash to some things going on in the community that it, and civil rights um, largely is what this was from. It was a backlash to the civil rights movement and some of the promiscuity that was happening in the 1970s. And so President Jimmy Carter um, was the first born again Christian and, and ran on this born again Christian ideology or ideal and really made up what was the um, moral majority, which became the Christian right. And this is really, really the first time that we see um, this intertwined or this alignment among uh, ideology and political ideology and religious belief. Now, it was always littered throughout our society um, and throughout our history, but Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan really doubled down on this idea of this moral majority or the Christian right being in entwined or ingrained with evangelical Protestants. And just so you can see what was going on, 81% of evangelicals voted, evangelical Protestants voted for Trump in 2016 and also in 2020. Now, uh, those numbers, depending on what source you use are, um, you know, plus or minus a couple of percentage points there, but that's the general, the general trend. And so this is uh, from a religion and politics blog, um, Ryan Burke gave us this, these data. So this is white evangelical Protestants in 2020 um, generally overwhelmingly um, supported the Republican candidate at, at 80%. You see that's up from um, 2008. So mainline Protestants are what we traditionally think about when we're thinking about religiosity in the United States. They are the old, oldest and wealthiest in the nation, meaning the oldest religious tradition that we have in the, the nation. Traditionally, they were the wealthiest in the nation. They took, they were in control of political office. They were elite, the elite members of society. And they are now thought of, and, and not now as in, you know, 2021, but in the last few decades, they have been um, thought of as the more liberal sect of Protestantism. And, and that's in uh, theology, as well as political ideology. So mainline Protestants view the Bible um, as inspired by God, not necessarily the literal word of God. And Mainline Protestants believe that the Bible should be read as a source of inspiration, but we need to think of it in terms of history and modern science. And this is one of the main divisions between mainline and evangelical Protestants. And it's when mainline Protestants embraced um, modern ideas such as Darwinism. Okay, and mainline Protestants uh, th their focus and through church teaching. So when we look at what types of messages pastors are giving to their congregation, we find that the emphasis in their, their sermons are on reflective spiritual development rather than this born again, accepting Jesus Christ as your savior experience. So, so um, the focus is on what can we learn about the moral precepts of Jesus? What can we learn about Jesus from the Bible? 1950s to 1960s, the same time the evangelical Protestants were going through uh, reformation, if you will, and transitioning from one ideology to another, the mainline Protestants Protestants were doing the exact same thing. Um, in the 1960s, uh, Protestant leaders were in, 
embracing um, the idea of reforming poverty, uh, rejecting racism, rejecting sexism, rejecting oppression, and they were um, putting forth this, this idea of peace and justice for all, especially the poor and disadvantaged. And they were favoring and continue to favor things like expanding government welfare, health healthcare uh, and, and programs that, that focus on uh, redistribution of government funds. There's a problem with all of this, um, and, and the, the mainline church has found that there's a problem with, with this openness of ideas and embracing uh, of, of everything, uh, and that's they are getting really diverse. And, and some scholars are saying, actually, it's too diverse, and that's the reason that their numbers are declining, um, decreasing numbers, because there's not really... Um, a cohesive understanding of what mainline Protestantism stands for. And th this is, by the way, this is this is debatable and it's different depending on which type of mainline Protestant you're identifying with. Some are um, stronger or st stricter in their doctrinal beliefs than others. But generally, mainline churches are, are open to doctrinal flexibility and this openness is hurting them in terms of numbers. Because remember, as I said before, in this pluralism uh, society or this diversity of religion, uh, people want a religious organization to tell them what to do, to tell them what to believe so that they can make sense of what's going on in the world. And so if, if mainline Protestantism can't give them that, then they move to another religious affiliation or another religious denomination. And what we're seeing is, um, some of them are finding a home in no religion or being unaffiliated. And so when you look at voting trends for mainline Protestants, you see that in 2020, um, it was a, it was a 50 50 split. Um, so mainline Protestants, th their voting behavior reflects some of what's going on in the church right now. Among the different denominations. So Catholicism. Catholicism, um, I, I will talk about uh, ca being a cafeteria Catholic in a second, but Catholicism um, is a little different, a little, it's a lot different than Protestantism or Protestants, but mainly dealing with the mysteries of faith. Um, and we won't, I can answer questions on um, Catholic theology if you'd like me to do that later on, but for time's sake, we're going to keep going. Uh, Roman Catholics are a swing demographic, and that's because they're they're kind of all over the place in, in what they believe and how they are voting politically. And this lack of unity among church leaders is leading to a lack of political clout because one congregation in one area um, is not voting in the same way that another congregation in another area is voting. And so this, this lack of unity is making it so that uh, we don't know what to expect from Roman Catholics. And this all started thanks to Vatican II. So 1961, notice a trend here, a lot's going on in the 60s. Um, Vatican II, it was the first time in two millennia that the, that the Catholic Church rewrote the church's tenets. And part of this, a lot of a lot went into this, but what we're going to focus on is that two things. Uh, first, the Catholic Church began to take a more political position. Now, that's not to say they're not involved in politics or endorsing candidates or anything like that, but they are speaking on public issues. That, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is they are accepting of Protestants as fellow Christians. And we are all one body or we're all in this together as members or, or um, adherence to Christ's principles. OK, and so from the 1960s, this this Vatican II, so 1961 to 1965, yielded a more politically active church. And what we find is that because of this um, more, when I say politically active, I mean um, teaching on um, different religious, uh, different, dif different public policies in relation to religion. Okay, so and what we find is that conservative and liberal candidates are both trying to find the Catholic vote um, because 
overall, things like social welfare or civil rights, military policy, they're generally more liberal. But in, in areas like abortion or divorce or same-sex marriage, they're generally conservative. But that doesn't hold true when we think about Hispanic Catholics. And I'm happy to talk about that uh, in the question and answer. Um, but I had to cut. I had to cut some things. <laughs> Or otherwise, I would just keep talking and talking and talking. Um, so the problems with all of this, uh, with Roman Catholicism, is that we are um, declining in numbers, and um, or they they are declining in numbers. So from twenty four to twenty one percent of the population, not as uh, significant in in a lot of ways as uh, mainline Protestants, or uh, the numbers is, are not as significant as mainline Protestants. But when, again, when we get to Hispanic. Um, Catholics, it the story changes for us a little bit, okay? And about that cafeteria style Catholicism, what I mean by that is Catholics are picking and choosing which parts of their faith they they want to um, believe in and they want to follow. So uh, if I tell I tell my students all the time, you you may know a cafeteria style Catholic. This is the one who has really strong opinions on same sex marriage and abortion, um, but it may be taking birth control or not going to church. And so we as Catholics can pick and choose what type of policy they are they are um, adhering to in the church as well as what policies they are uh, aligning with politically. So it makes it really difficult for political scientists to know what side Catholics will fall on. So when you look at the white Catholic voting trends, uh, you'll see 58% in 2020. So it's up from 2016 in support for the Republican candidate, but it's, it's not, um, it's close. It's close. It's not overwhelming like the the numbers were for um, white the white evangelical Protestants. So when we talk about Judaism, um, there are three major groups that we think about and that we need to be aware of. Um, Jews make up a small portion of our electorate, but something's going on, and that something that's going on is that this Orthodox group is actually growing in number. So the reform and the conservative groups of Judaism are, um, they, they are the more liberal where conservative is actually the, the middle ground between the reform um, and the Orthodox, Orthodox being the, the most strict. Orthodox Jews are growing in number, having bigger families, and actually are organizing a little bit more politically than this reform and conservative group. Some, something that's going on among Jewish individuals in the United States is that 62% uh, of Jews are reporting that being Jewish is part of their culture, but not religion. Uh, so, so being a Jew is ancestry linked or culture related, not necessarily a religious matter. And 17% do not believe in God. So as I said before, an exception to um, Jews starting to participate less uh, in both religious ceremonies and religious communities is the Orthodox Jewish community, which is growing steadily, and they are um, reaffirming their commitment to Judaism. And these larger families are having children who are then raised in the faith, um, and they are going on to have more children who are raised in the faith, so their number is growing, and they happen to be more conservative and hold conservative beliefs and ideology. And so if you look at the numbers here for political liberalism, 78% of Jews voted for Obama in 2012. That number went down in 20, um, 2016, 71% voting for Clinton, and Joe Biden got 60% of votes in, in 2020. Um, and so this is this is indicative of some shift that's going on among the, the Jewish community and their attachment to groups um, and their congregations or, or uh, synagogue and and also their attachment to the political world. I just said this, so I'm not going to say it again, but I'm happy to revisit. 
So Muslims and Islam, we need to talk about what's going on here too, because we are also seeing a, a pattern of conservative Muslims in the United States. And uh, this, these conservative groups, just like um, the, the Jewish uh, Orthodox groups, they are growing in number and they tend to be more um, conservative. And so this was the split, 64% um, for Biden and 35% for Trump in the 20, um, 2020 election. And so we need to, we cannot continue on before without talking about the secular and other or disaffiliated um, members of society. And here, one third of millennials have no religious affiliation. And the majority of uh, these people who can, are secular or disaffiliated or not aligning with a particular religious tradition, um, they, they are nothing in particular. So it's not that they're atheist or agnostic, because um, those have very specific meanings and, and definitions that go, go along with that, but they're just, they're nothing in particular. They don't have a home, they're disaffiliated. So how do we think about religion? If you, you know by now, um, this is really complex and we're seeing a bunch of different um, alignments and realignments and we're trying to, scholars are trying to keep up with all of these different alignments and realignments. So we used to think about religion in terms of Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. And what were Protestant, Catholics, and Jews doing? How were they voting? What policies did they support? That's the ethno-religious perspective where, where um, religious groups are groups. Then we've moved groups, meaning social groups, where they think and behave like the social group that they belong to, individuals do. Then we move to this traditional modernism. This is that uh, culture wars clash. So, so people, um, conservative Catholics are aligning with conservative Protestants and progressive Jews are aligning with progressive Protestants and progressive Catholics. So this traditional modernism. And now we're left with this belonging, behaving, and believing. And I have some recommendations for really good books if you're interested in reading more about belonging, behaving, and believing. But essentially, Belonging, behaving, believing are the three classifications of religion or religiosity. So our history tells us that we need to think about religion in terms of belonging. So what type of denomination? But where we are now is we need to think about religion in terms of behaving too. How frequently are people going to church? How much are they praying? How much are they participating? Are they doing are they volunteering in their churches? Are they donating to their churches? Are they doing other activities within their congregations um, that enhances their religious experience? Um, and then lastly, how are they believing or what are they believing? So this is things like the importance of religion and, and one's life and whether you think religion is giving you the guidance that you need to get through the day. And most most um, heavily relied on is this biblical translation or that's that biblical literalism. So do you believe that the Bible is the literal word of God? So when we think about religion now, we're really thinking about belonging, behaving, and believing, not just along Protestant Catholic Jew lines. So if we look at, I won't get into the, uh, the belonging because we just did all of that, but an example with, with all the um, descriptions of how re different religious groups are uh, participating in politics and some of the things that they believe. Uh, so religious behaving, you'll see um, this is the, thanks to the people at Gallup, this is the decrease. It shows a decrease in um, people who are identifying um, as a member of a church or synagogue or mosque. So in 1940, we were at 73%. Um, and now in 2020, we're at 47% of people um, who are identifying with being a member of some organization, religious organization. And when we look at this is another example of um, um, behaving, religious behaving. So frequency of prayer. So when we look at how uh, the percentage of adults who are reporting that they're praying at least daily, we're at 55%, weekly is 16%, and then monthly uh, is at 6%. Um, so, so over the majority of uh, 55% is a slim majority of people are, are, are um praying at least daily. 
some things to think about, and I just have a bunch of stats up here. We can walk through this later um, if, if you all want to, but um, religious believing, um, we're at 89% of Americans believe in God or a universal spirit. And that's where things get a little um, fuzzy because is it God or is it a universal spirit or is it capturing both um, in this, this survey question? And I think it's capturing both, but 89% um, believe in God, 63% um, are certain of God's existence. Uh, and then, uh, you know, 79 of other notes, 79% believe in miracles. So if we're thinking about how this matters politically and how people are voting, politically um, or, or policy selecting, um, if we take the same-sex marriage, religious belonging or denomination, as a, the same-sex marriage as an example of how the different religions sort themselves, um, we see that uh, there's no clear position among these, these groups, but prohibit same-sex marriage. You have American Baptist, Roman Catholic Church. So that's both Protestant. You have Protestant, you have um, Mormons, you have Protestants, you have Christian, Christians, uh, Protestants are Christian. Um, and you have the Roman Catholic Church. You have a lot of different religious denominations prohibiting or their tenets prohibit same-sex marriage. Um, and then if you look at the sanctions of same-sex marriage, you have, uh, again, you have a lot of or several of these um, churches that allow same-sex marriage are also Protestant churches. So you're seeing this alignment of conservative churches aligning with conservative churches uh, or, or sex and, and progressives aligning with progressives. And if you look at this um, in relation to church attendance, so same-sex marriage um, with church attendance, what you need to get from this is that as church attendance increases, so as you move from never going to church, which is zero, to four, going to church once a day, support for same-sex marriage decreases. So when we think about this behaving comp component, um, and then we can sort this by religious group, and, and we... So, so religious group in addition to church attendance, we see that support for same-sex marriage decreases even more among conservative religious groups. And if you do this by biblical literalism, so believing that the Bible is the literal word of God, you see that there's, again, this, this green line at the top, there is a slight decrease, but decrease in support for same-sex marriage. So where are we now? Um, well, even though we have a lot of younger folks um, not aligning with religion or becoming religiously unaffiliated or not participating in religious services, uh, generally the public is confident in religious groups and religious organizations. And clergy, if you ask about clergy, they're ranked among the highest in things like being ethical and honest. Um, and 75% of Americans think believe that church organizations help to strengthen morality in society. Look what we have there, that Puritan <laughs> ideology filtering its way through to 2021. So political parties know this, they know what's going on. And as a result to knowing that the public still places high regard on religion um, and, and the public is turning to, generally the public still turns to their uh, religious principles and their congregations to shape their policy opinions, we've noticed a pull for the Republican Party to take these conservatives or this conservative share of the electorate where the Democratic Party pulls or takes the progressive share of the electric, elect, electorate. Okay, and this, these parties and the political candidates are now emphasizing more cultural issues than they are, um, um, economic issues. And I can talk more about that if you're interested. I, I've done some research on like the difference between prioritization of cultural issues and economic issues as it relates to religious individuals. So we can talk, we can talk about more about that later. But what we're seeing is that the parties are now pulling conservatives among the different religious organizations and progressives among the different religious organizations. So Republicans are conservative and Democratic Party is pulling the progressives. 
So the future of this, this religion and politics world is understanding morality policy or morality politics. And morality politics or policies um, is the result of or um, what comes after this culture wars theory so or, or this culture wars way of life um, and this is these these their controversies over deeply held values that are complex and we can't easily understand um, what the right or the wrong thing to do is however um, these issue positions that people take deal with what is right and wrong and what is the right and wrong way of living um, and so, so these moral issues have become a dominant part of our political elections and, and our societies. So these are things like life and death policy or gender and sexuality. So things like homosexuality or sex education, transgender rights. Um, we're talking about other things like drug policy or like the legalization of marijuana. These are all considered morality policies, and, and these are the hot button or hot topic issues that we're noticing uh, politicians are focusing on when they are campaigning, because there's a right way to do it according to what we believe, right, in this culture wars frame, there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it, and there's no in between. And so by taking a hard stance on one um, a hard stance on one way of, a, of approaching or addressing the issue, you are pitting the other against you. And there, there's no in between. You can't have um, a little bit of legalization of marijuana, for example, or a little bit of capital punishment. So looking forward, um, we are thinking about understanding better religious behaving and religious beliefs. So how are gone are the days, right, of, of just looking at Protestant Catholics and Jews and how they're voting. Um, we, are, we are looking to religious behaving, religious beliefs, so how frequently are people engaging in their religious congregations, because that can tell us how frequently they will participate in politics, and we're also interested in religious beliefs. How true do they hold to their doctrinal beliefs? How conservative are in their their doctrinal ideology. And um, another uh, thing that we're looking at is this rise of the religious left. So um, the rise of the nuns and the rise of the religious left, the rise of the religious left, and I can talk more about this if you're interested in it, um, but there's, there's the religious right, which have conservative political beliefs and con conservative ideology and conservative religious principles. And in relate, and that movement, by the way, has been really successful in mobilizing people to vote. But there's a lack of religious left, and and social scientists for very many years couldn't figure out what was going on and why there was no there was no rise of the religious left. But um, we're we're noticing that the religious left is starting to make a presence in terms of personal secularism, which is like the uh, antithesis or the opposite of religious belonging, behaving, and believing. So it's actually the affirmation of sex, secularism. So people are, are um, engaging in secular communities now, like they weren't doing, they were unorganized as, as few, as little as like five years ago, they were unorganized, but now they are organizing around the secular community. They are participating in this secular community and they have a certain set of beliefs and principles. And so the, we're looking for at two things, the rise of the, the religious left, and then again, the rise of, of personal secularism, which is not necessarily religious. Okay, I cannot believe I got through that. I moved really quickly. <laughs> but we're here and I think I'm just in time. Thank you, I don't see Julianne yeah. here. <laughs> um, at this point, um, Julianne will take questions. Uh, so please raise your hands and you will be recognized. <laughs> Go ahead. Julianne. That was impressive, thank you. Okay, so we do have, I saw a couple chats come in during the, the lecture. Angela, can you see the chats yeah. or would you like me to read yeah. them? Yes, I can. I'm just terrible at multitasking. So I can I'm read sorry. it. Um, so Catholics are similar to mainline Protestants. Uh, yes. 
Yes, that's true. And then, yeah, so Catholics are um, now when we think about Catholics, we're also thinking about white Catholics and Latino or Hispanic Catholics, because Hispanic Catholics are traditionally um, they are they're they're more conservative than the, the mainline or the Roman Catholics um, who, who are the, those cafeteria style Catholics where they pick and choose what they what they like to believe at any given moment. Um, uh, Hispanic Catholics are very conservative, especially in issues such as abortion, same-sex marriage, all of these morality policy issues. Um, they tend to be more liberal, though, on um, redistribution or economic policies. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm over here in the Oak Room now, and I have a guest from the Oak Room question. Yeah, that was just great. I'm breathless. Are you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I didn't hear mentioned by name is that something I'm observing in the places I've lived, and it may be within my age group, but more, and that is a movement towards an Eastern form of spirituality as expressed in mindfulness and yoga training, and um, I, I suppose it's closest to spiritual but not religious. But I feel like they are a presence because in many communities, they begin to meet and yep. grow support from one another and talk through the issues. So help me with how that fits into the statistics. Yeah, so, so you're exactly right. Those are the individuals who are saying that they are spiritual, but not religious. Um, they can also fall under the non-denomination group um, or the religious other. So these people are, they tend to be really scattered in terms of letting us or allowing us to classify where they are. They're a little ambiguous, but as I was saying with um, what's coming next, we're actually looking into this personal secularism and trying to quantify or group these people who are spiritual but not religious, who we can't really define because they're kind of all over the place. Um, we're looking at grouping them or finding an appropriate way to group them to come up with a better understanding of who they are and how they're particip participating because they most definitely are participating. We just can't pinpoint how they're participating if they're there. Some of them are um, identifying as being spiritual and some of them are identifying as being other religious or, you know, of other religious groups or um, non-denominational. But what we do know is that the trend is an, is for an increase that these people are um, predominantly younger individuals. So uh, 40, 35 and under is, is really where these people are concentrated. Thank you. Anne Marie, did you have a different question? Um, yes, I did. Um, but the reason that I asked the question about Latinx uh, leaving the Catholic Church had to do with the fact that um, it's one area where um, Catholicism is seeing some definite flux. I mean, other than the fact that they're losing congregations across the U.S. anyway. Um, and I'm fascinated by the fact that it, that it's that they're moving in that direction, that they're moving in the more um, evangelical uh, direction. And I, I wanted to ask a question. Um, you had mentioned that you would talk about um, how parties are targeting um, religions and the progressives are targeting, um, you know, the more um, liberal religions and so forth. And, and the reason I'm interested in this is because, you know, in looking at the culture wars, I'm trying to tease out how much of the concern about um, where parties ought to be targeting their message has to do with demographics and just that whole idea that we're moving towards a different uh, U.S. demographically and that that is really driving a lot of movement on the right. And I'm wondering how much you think um, religion is serving as a kind of proxy um, yeah. for the racial and ethnic demographics in some way, because I, this interests me, you know, the, the fact that they are um, uh, part of the culture war messages. Yeah, and, and I hate to say it, but it's almost like they're, the politician's cheap shot is to bring religion into it and to pull at the heartstrings of how how um, the things that religious individuals believe in. And that's exactly what's happening. And so what, what was happening as a backlash to, to the United States becoming more progressive, i.e. the 1950s, 1960s um, through the 70s, was this rise of the religious right in response to 
um, this this progressive, more progressive way. So the religious right was um, doubling down on tradition and moral values and and strongly believing in like the women's place in the home and men should go to work and um, no birth control and that you should have big families. And the backlash, what we're seeing now is the backlash to that. We're seeing the, the rise of the religious left joining with people who are secular or, or who are not affiliated with any type of religious organization or denomination, backlashing the backlash. Um, and so, yes, we are moving. And 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 then politicians, they don't live in a vacuum. Like they recognize these things and they see public opinion trends. And what they know in light of this culture war is that some people, um, people are very strong in their opinions on Abortion. If you look at tr general trends over time, the last 50 years hasn't changed very much. Uh, overall, it hasn't changed very much. But if they can focus in on the religious individuals among um, in that congregation or among religious individuals who believe that same sex marriage or abortion is wrong in any instance, then they can try to pull from that portion of the electorate and get them to vote for that for that um, for that party or that that politician because your views on abortion are unwavering. And, and as we see with all of these moral policy issues. So um, absolutely people are, um, the political parties and politicians are pulling at um, moral policy issues. Thank you, Rick. Uh, you did a great job of uh, the 400 years of history. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know you had to leave some things out. One thing that I noticed was that there's a difference between the federal government and the state governments in, in terms of their uh, warmth towards religion, that this, this federal government was from the very beginning and uh, committed to uh, separation of church and state, whereas many states still had official religions and even in their constitutions today, seven states forbid non-believers from holding public office. I'm wondering whether uh, in your research or within the field that there's been talk about how religion interacts with the federal government versus the state government. Yeah, so so yes, I say I said yes really quickly. Really no, but kind of yes in that uh, it's not an issue until it becomes a problem. So we see this when with things like what's going on with Texas and their abortion laws. Um, so so it's it's sparse in the field, which is why we have this field of morality politics coming up because the, those problems are very much um, like federal versus state um, type of, of, of issues. And it's coming, but we don't, we don't really know, or at least I'm not familiar with a strong line of research that um, talks about the differences between church and state until, unless or until it's a problem. And we saw it like in Pennsylvania in the 1800s when they had a formalized religion. Um, but unless it's a problem, we're not talking about it, but what is what we, we're noticing is a problem is um, at the federal the federal level. So I'm sorry I can't answer more on that, um, but I, I don't think there's much there. If there is, I'm not familiar. Thank you. Go ahead, Bud. Hi, Angela. Your presentation was absolutely wonderful. I was Thank my branch chief of staff in the governor's office and in the Senate office. And our politics was pretty much moderate and centrist. And I'm wondering how large that moderate or centrist body is in the, in the political climate today. Yeah, so, um, well, it depends on who you talk to. So there are some political scientists who fall on this, this sword of, you know, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. We are politically polarized. Everyone is either a Democrat or Republican, and there's nobody in the middle, and we need to appeal to the, the polls. Um, and then there's this other group of scholars that's like, well, wait, not really. The only people on the extremes are the extremes. And if you look at the overall electorate, everyone's kind of in the middle, like the mainline Protestants and the uh, white Catholics, they all fall in the middle of these two poles. And so um, the greatest share of the vote 
goes to the person who can align most closely with the greatest share of the electorate electorate in their area or in their district. And so this does look different from, you know, county level data or state level data than it, than um, federal or federal elections. Um, but there's two fields of thought, one being that we are um, very extreme and polarized and one being that we're all just really moderate. And in both ways of doing things, politicians are interested in plucking the largest share. So whether that largest share, they're, they're polling and, and their polling um, results are showing them that their largest share is actually polarized, then then they will pluck from the polarized groups. But if if they, when they poll um, and they know in their congregation or in their district or wherever that um, the majority of people are moderate, then they're going to pull from that. And and I can share resources if you all want the resources on that. But um, Downs is economic theory of democracy talks about um, how politicians. Um, use this this space to to uh, get the the most of the vote share. Does that answer it? I, I think. <laughs> Thank you. How do we do, Angela, compared to your students? Oh, y'all are great. Y'all are much better. <laughs> Don't tell <laughs> them I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to hear that. All right, yeah. Deb, go ahead. Ask your question. Yes, just I wanted to comment on what you just said, that most try and go to the middle. Um, that has been true with my decade study uh, of politics, but I'm um, totally confused with what's going on now. And you gave a great presentation, but uh, clearly Trump and the Trump supporters are not following that. They are going to the stream. They're, they're, they aren't attempting to go towards the middle at all. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So we, it's, it's the Trump phenomenon for many reasons. And, and so we've done, uh, I've done a little bit of research on what happened among the masses or like the general electorate with this Trump phenomenon, um, but among religious, which is what, like the real focus of my study, but among religious people, um, they are aligned and have consistently been aligned with Trump. There are other things not related to religion that goes on with the general vote um, for Trump in 2016, as, as well as um, 2020. I, I cannot speak to overall trends other than um, there's a lot going on and we, we are still trying to figure it out. Data was just released on the 2020 election like two months ago. So political scientists are like scrambling right now to try to understand like what other components of this Trump effect um, is what other things are going on. But, I, but that's a great observation. I, I agree. It's something weirds going on. Any other questions or comments? This was a most impressive session. Lynn, do you have any final comments or you want to talk about next week? Well, before I do, I did, I had an observation too. I was listening to a webinar, um, a Harvard webinar with Linda Greenhouse, and she commented that the Southern Baptist Convention passed resolutions in 1971, 1974, 1976 after Roe versus Wade, affirming that the idea that women uh, should have access to abortion, and um, government should um, actually play a limited role. And I wanted to, to, and fast forward, we're seeing something rather different here. Perhaps you could just say a few words about how that evolved very quickly. Yeah, it's, it's people need to, to win elections, you need to pit yourself against the competition and you need to win against the competition. And what we're, we are, we're finding is that people, uh, different religious groups, they may be realigning with certain other religious groups in hopes to um, congregate, no, no pun intended, but to congregate around a particular issue so that they can get the best candidate. And the best candidate may not be in line with every single ideology that they believe in, or they might not support every single thing that that religious group supports, um, but it's the, the lesser of two evils in, in many ways. And so we are, we notice that the stance of of, of many um, Protestant churches uh, is actually the access access to abortion um, is generally accepted um, 
but not among evangelical Protestants. So, so I think people are still trying to um, figure out where they land and they're looking to church leaders and the clergy to guide them and where they should go. And that's the problem with some of the religious organizations is that they're kind of wishy-washy in, in what, um, what stances they take and they may flip-flop a little bit. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank um, Dr. McCarthy for um, her her talk, and um, I also want to say that next week, Dr. Lynn Leverty will be talking about Latin voters in Florida. Um, Rick, did you have a question or comment? Your hand is up. No, it's just an applause button. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, anyway, thank you very much, and um, we appreciate it. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.